Well, I'll ask you again to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 52. And as Pastor Tom mentioned, <clears throat> we are actually in a study in 1 Samuel, but I wanted to stop and take a little bit of time to work through Psalm 52, which David wrote in the midst of some of the circumstances that we have read about in 1 Samuel. So with it having already been read, let's take a moment to ask the Lord to bless our time together in the Word, and then we'll continue. Our Father God, as we come before your Word to hear it preached this morning, we would pray the prayer that we just sang, that you would be our vision, that our eyes would be filled with your plan of redemption and your sovereign goodness in our lives, and that, Lord, even as we continue on in Psalm 52 today, Lord, you would teach us to live by faith, to walk by faith, those things that we can't see, Lord, that you would teach us to live our lives with those things in view, with the eyes of faith, that you are in control and you are continuing to work your plan for our good and for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I know many of you are, are here parachuted into this study, so let's just take a moment to remember where we are. Those of you who have been here, you will find this somewhat familiar, and I'll try to be uh, concise and yet say enough so that we can appreciate what uh, David is saying in Psalm 52. So at this point in uh, 1 Samuel, we have seen now David is a fugitive on the run from a paranoid and desperate King Saul. And the incident connected to Psalm 52 involved David's visit to the priest Ahimelech at Nob. And you'll notice perhaps as Pastor Tom uh, read the heading of Psalm 52, it says, to the chief musician, a contemplation of David when Doeg the Edomite went and told Saul and said to him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. Doeg the Edomite, chief of Saul's herdsmen, saw Ahimelech inquire of the Lord for David as well as give David provisions and Goliath's sword. So a while later, at an opportune time, when Saul was in a particularly desperate and paranoid frame of mind, Doeg conveys that information to Saul, resulting in a court-like setting where Saul calls in Ahimelech the priest and all of his father's house, the priests who ministered in Nob. So Saul, in this desperate rage, falsely accuses Ahimelech of treasonous motives and then orders his execution along with all of his father's house. Well, Saul's regular guards would not do it, but Doeg willingly takes up the task, killing 85 priests as well as the rest of Nob, which included destroying men, women, children, babies, as well as oxen, donkeys, and sheep. Abiathar, one of Ahimelech's sons, escaped and ran to David, who promised him safety. But a key part of the record in David, uh, is David's response that we read about in 1 Samuel. David's response to Abiathar's report was, I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. And David was referring to his trip to see Ahimelech, but likely also referring to the fact that he had lied to Ahimelech and hid the fact that Saul was after him. And so instead of protecting him with the truth, he actually put his life at risk through lies. And we have been seeing one of the truths, one of the applications that we have been seeing from this study is that God does use the wicked and their wickedness to accomplish his purposes. God has decreed all things, but he is not the one behind sin. And so while he allows it and he uses it, God does not initiate sin or tempt people to sin. This is the clear teaching of Scripture, even though it blows away our, our human minds. God used the wickedness of men to accomplish his judgment against the house of Eli. 
I think our confession is helpful in summarizing this truth. In uh, chapter 5 and paragraph 4, our confession on divine providence says, The almighty power, unsearchable wisdom, and infinite goodness of God are so thoroughly demonstrated in His providence that His sovereign plan includes even the first fall and every other sinful action both of angels and humans. God's providence over sinful actions does not occur by simple permission, but by a form of permission that God most wisely and powerfully limits and in other ways arranges and governs. Through a complex arrangement of methods, He channels sinful actions to accomplish His perfectly holy purposes. Yet He does this in such a way that the sinfulness of their acts arises only from the creatures and not from God, because God is altogether holy and righteous. He can neither originate nor approve of sin. So those are some of the bigger picture concepts that we've been talking about pertaining to God's decrees. But we've also, in studying Psalm 52, wanted to address the personal grief that David felt about his own responsibility and about the death of all of the people in Nob. So last week we started looking at Psalm 52, and and we want to continue to think about God's decree in the face of man's evil, but we also want to think about how difficulties and calamities can bring great personal grief and confusion to us tempting us to lose faith and doubt God. And so we want to see ourselves in Psalm 52 as David wrestles with all that happened in the massacre at Nob. So as I mentioned last week, we're we're thinking about things in our own lives and in the life of our church, like the civil war in Myanmar that we've been praying about, or the war in Ukraine or senseless murders that have touched our church family, or highway accidents, or mental health concerns, or physical illnesses with no answers, or relationship struggles, or sex trafficking, or child abuse, or the COVID epidemic, just to name some of the darkness in this sin-cursed world. How do we process the evil in this world, especially when it comes close to us and those that we know and love? Or perhaps it's even our own sin that influences the situation. Well, we process the evil in this world by thinking biblically and eternally and through the eyes of redemption Even as David has said in the psalm that the goodness of God endures continually. And so how do we process these things? Now as we began to look at Psalm 52 last week, we remembered that the occasion that David wrote about was pretty specific, but as is often the case, and I think this is good, this is by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, David actually writes in a more open-ended fashion. And so I do think that David has men like Doeg in mind, even as the inscription would imply. And certainly David has in mind men like Saul, who fits this description as well. But in a Holy Spirit-inspired way, we are also able to fill in the blanks with the evil people that we come across or the situations that we live through in this world. So we began last week looking at a couple of things here in this chapter. First of all, we saw the charges against the wicked in verses 1 through 4. David opens with the question and kind of a contrast here where he says, Why do you boast in evil, O mighty man? The goodness of God endures continually. David says, You who have used your talent and your position and your wealth to control others? You tyrant, why do you boast in deeds like the destruction of Nob? You have not removed God from His throne or stopped the execution of His decree. 
His goodness still flows as a never-ending stream. God's justice will prevail. And then he brings these charges in verses 2 through 4 where he says that a, a heart of evil will find expression in lies, deceit, and destruction, hurting other people and using them to your own advantage, even murdering like Saul and Doeg did. And this is in sharp contrast with God's people who are committed to speaking truth and righteousness even if it comes at a personal cost. In verses 5 through 7, we saw the sentence on the wicked. Verse 5, that God shall likewise destroy you forever. And verse 5 indicates complete destruction in judgment for those who remain unrepentant and condemned in their sins. So instead of living and resting confidently and safely in your own house with a measure of health and prosperity, complete destruction is coming to unrepentant sinners like Doeg and Saul. Now, some people will realize this kind of judgment during this life, but even if that is largely not the case, these wicked men will face God's holy judgment for the rest of eternity. God has given us this life to prepare for the next one, but too many people only live for the here and now and according to what they can see. And David assures us that whether it's now or later, perfect justice will be executed. And if sinners are not found in Christ with their sins forgiven and the righteousness of Jesus clothing them so they can be accepted in God's holy presence, sinners will face eternal judgment. And David proposes this in Psalm 52 as consolation to those who are affected by the murderous hearts of these types of people. But then in verses 6 and 7, and I think it's really a part of the sentence against evildoers, is that the righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh. Here is the man who did not make God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened himself in his wickedness. So sometimes the righteous see God's justice in their lifetimes. But often, it is through the eyes of faith that the righteous look into the future and see the reality of God's perfect justice even if it is not realized now. And we saw last time that there's a unique combination here of fear and laughter. A holy fear of God's judgment, even if it is against others, is the proper response of the godly person. When we think about God's judgment on sinners, it is sobering and should produce a holy fear and even change how we live. And the laughter is not the result of a gleeful and vengeful delight in the calamity of the wicked, but rather it's a laughter of relief and of approval that the wickedness is gone and righteous judgment has come. So we saw in this psalm the charges against the wicked and the sentence on the wicked and now this morning, we're continuing on with the last main point, the response to the wicked in verses 8 and 9. And what I want us to think about as we finish out this psalm this morning is how should I live in this fallen world when evil impacts me and those that I love? Maybe it's a big situation with an identifiable evil person who is sinning against you. Or it might just be calamity that comes because we live in this sin-cursed world. And I want to propose three things to you from the text from verses 8 and 9. Number one, I will regularly meditate on my position as an adopted child of God. 
Number two, I will regularly praise God for His faithfulness, even in the storm. And number three, I will regularly gather with the saints in order to wait upon God. I will regularly meditate on my position as an adopted child of God. Verse 8 says, But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy or the steadfast love, the chesed, of God forever and ever. So I think what you see in David's language here is the exhortation for us to regularly meditate on our positions if we are in Christ, if we know the Lord, to meditate regularly on my relationship or my position as an adopted child of God. This imagery that he uses in verse 8 is somewhat common. An olive tree was considered a very good thing, a life-giving thing, something that would grow well and was at the heart of uh, flourishing in that economy and in that lifestyle. And so the indication here, the imagery is of a spiritual flourishing. A green olive tree is a flourishing, fruit-bearing, life-giving plant. And this is a very positive imagery that one who is a follower of Jehovah is like a green olive tree in the house of God. You're probably familiar with passages like Psalm 128 where similar imagery is used. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house, your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. So the one who fears the Lord is described in these poetic terms as one whose, whose wife is a fruitful vine and the children are like olive plants around the table. Well, in a spiritual sense, what David is describing in Psalm 52 is someone who is flourishing unexpectedly. Why would I say that? Well, think about the context. David is writing here as a man on the run. And so he's not writing this because he feels physically safe or because he's living his best life, as they say, but rather as one who is safe in the promised Messiah. David says, I, even as a man on the run being chased by the king, I can flourish spiritually even in the midst of persecution or trial. And brothers and sisters, sometimes the flourishing comes especially because of the persecution or the trial, which was designed for our good and for our sanctification. And when the heat of the furnace is turned up, God does a good work of sanctifying us, and purifying us, and oftentimes it's through the trials that He does some of His greatest work. So in the house of God, I'm a member of His family. The Father loves me. I, I am, even though outwardly it may not seem like this in the outward circumstances of my life, but the spiritual reality of being safe in Christ means that I am in a permanent, stable situation, and my soul is safe, even if my body isn't. God's faithful love will follow me all of my life and right on into eternity, shielding me from God's just wrath in court and safely ushering me into his presence because of what Jesus has done on my behalf. I trust in his mercy forever. I couldn't help but think of passages like what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 1 in his opening words to the saints that he addressed, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Brothers and sisters, I would write down that passage as a go-to passage for struggling through trials and having an eternal perspective of faith in the midst of that. It's 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Go to it. Go back to it. Read it. Reread it. When your faith pales in the light of difficult circumstances, go back to 1 Peter 1 and read the words of the Apostle Peter by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that combines God's great love and His sovereign plan with the difficult circumstances that we go through in this life and how to view by faith what God will ultimately bring us to. Come back to that passage on a regular basis. The words of David would remind us when I am a flourishing olive tree in the house of God, trusting in the steadfast love of God, it reminds me that God loves me. The Father loves me. The Son loves me. The Holy Spirit loves me. And the triune God is committed to preserving my soul and bringing me safely home. Now, a question that is often asked, and we've dealt with it some at Arbor through the years, and sometimes these things can get complicated, so if you have specific questions, let's have a conversation. But a question that often comes up is, how do I interpret intense trials in my life? It's true that sometimes our own sin can bring the chastening hand of God. And it doesn't always look much different than the trials that everyone else goes through. It's really only through the eyes of faith that I remember and am convinced that trials that come, if they are addressing specific sin, it's the chastening of a loving Heavenly Father. And the eyes of faith through the lens of Scripture remind us of that. Hebrews 12, you're familiar, I'm sure, many of you, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. And then the author quotes from Proverbs 3, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. And then the author of Hebrews again, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons, as with children. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Chastening from God may or may not be because of specific sins committed. But it's not the same thing as condemnation and judgment in our sin. And it's always, this is something I've told people and I've tried to remind myself, If I'm not sure exactly why a trial has come or if it is in regards to specific sin that God is dealing with me about, it's always a good time to repent. If God is turning up the furnace of affliction and He's showing us our sin, then whatever reason, however we got there, it's a good time to repent, 
to turn from that sin, to ask the Lord to forgive us of that sin and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. It's always a good time to repent and renew our faith in the steadfast love of God. But the truth is, we often don't know exactly why God is doing what He's doing. Sometimes it's like Job. It's not because of some specific thing, although some were, would be quick to say, it must have been something that you did, Job. And God said, no, I'm going to magnify my name in his life. And he's going to be a testimony of my glory and of my grace. So we don't always know exactly what's going on. And certainly there's enough sin remaining in our lives so that when circumstances come, we certainly could be reminded of the sin that remains. Again, I think it's helpful to hear the summary of this truth in our confession. Again, chapter 5 on divine providence. This is the next chapter, or paragraph, paragraph 5. The perfectly wise, righteous, and gracious God often allows His own children for a time to experience a variety of temptations and the sinfulness of their own hearts. He does this to chastise them for their former sins, or to make them aware of the hidden strength of the corruption and deceitfulness of their hearts so that they may be humbled. He also does this to lead them to a closer and more constant dependence on Him, to sustain them, to make them more cautious about all future circumstances that may lead to sin, and for other just and holy purposes." So whatever happens to any of his elect happens by his appointment, for his glory, and for their good. If any of you were thinking about making a plaque for the wall, that might be a text for it. Putting the words of the confession on the wall? Well, doesn't that sound an awful lot like Romans 8, 28? God does everything that turns out for the good of His people. Whatever happens to any of His elect happens by His appointment, for His glory, and for their good. I will regularly meditate on my position as an adopted child of God. Number two. These are all under, there's three of these. I've mentioned them already, and they're under that last heading of the response to the wicked. Number two, my response to the wicked, I will regularly praise God for His faithfulness even in the storm. The beginning of verse 9 says, I will praise you forever because you have done it. Now let's think about what praising God actually is or what it means. Uh, praising God is a response of faith. We've already said that some things will not be addressed until the eternal state and until that great day of God's judgment, but we can live today with these realities, these truths in view. And I want to propose that these faith-filled responses are appropriate whether there is a wicked person involved in the situation or even if you're simply addressing the calamity of living in a broken and fallen world. But specifically in the text, David says, God has done it. Done what? Well, in the context, I think that refers to the fact that God has judged the wicked and accomplished perfect justice, which has ultimately resulted in the vindication and salvation of those who trust in Him. Now, the eyes of faith see this as a done deal, or in other words, it's as good as done even if it hasn't yet happened. It's as good as accomplished. And so when David says, God has done it, um, it, it's pretty clear, I think, in the text that Saul is still on the throne and chasing him, trying to kill him. And there's no indication that I'm aware of that Doeg has been judged for his crimes. Yet David writes it in this sense that I will praise you forever because you have, have done it. And in the eyes of faith, David sees that the reality to come is as good as has already happened because of God's faithfulness. 
there is coming a day when all of creation will be made new and sin with its effects will no longer be present and we will be forever with the Lord. But faith allows us to praise and to live today in light of that future unrealized reality. So praising God is a response of faith. Praising God also recognizes God's greatness. When David says, I will praise you forever, he's saying, God is worthy of our praise because of who he is, because of his being. He's the almighty, eternal creator God. He's worthy of our praise because of his character, which includes being perfectly holy and just. And he's worthy of our praise because of his faithfulness, his covenant dealings with his people. His promises will not fail. So God is the Almighty, the Holy and Faithful One, and he will never go back on his promises. He's faithful to every one of them, whether promises of salvation or promises of judgment. Praising God recognizes God's greatness. Not only then is praising God a response of faith, And not only does it recognize his greatness, but praising God involves thanksgiving. You could say in many ways that's that's kind of what it is. It's a giving of thanks, and not just for the good things, things that we would call good, but it's in everything giving thanks, even if we're having to give thanks by faith. Lord, you've said this is good for me, and so I'm going to say with you that this is good for me, I don't see how, but you are a good God and you have said that, this, that you will work these things for good. So even if the thing itself is definitely not a good thing, maybe it's even an evil thing, you have said to everything to give thanks and that you will work this thing for my good. And so in faith, I trust you and I give thanks for it because of what you're going to do in my life through it. So we don't just tolerate God's providence, but by faith we accept it and see it as good and profitable. And we can only do this when we're convinced that our good God will use sin, ours and that of other people, and that God will use calamity to accomplish his purposes. What could that possibly be? What could God do through somebody's sin or through some horrible calamity? Well, it it might be the salvation of some. It might be the sanctification of others. It might work in our hearts a greater love for God and less love for things. But something we need to remember, brothers and sisters, is that there's nothing on this earth causing God to wring his hands in helpless angst. There's nothing on this earth causing God to wring his hands in helpless angst. Kids, what that means, wringing your hands, is when you don't know what to do and you're stressed out and you don't have the answers and you're struggling and you're worried and you say, what do I do, what do I do? And what I'm saying is God is never wringing his hands trying to figure out how he could possibly work something good out of a situation that has spiraled out of his control because there's no such thing. So I will regularly meditate on my position as an adopted child of God. I will regularly praise God for his faithfulness even in the storm. And number three, I will regularly gather with the saints in order to wait on God. Now, what I'm going to say from here forward is probably not quite as common, but I think it is really, really important. And I think it's what the text is saying. In the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name, for it is good. 
So all of verse 9 says, I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. Now, the concept, first of all, of waiting, we even sing a song, don't we? I will wait for you, I will wait for you, and it's in the context of difficulties that we sing that song. Well, waiting implies at least a couple of things. It implies dependence upon God and patience in the trial. The concept of dependence is that in that trial, I'm looking to God in faith even when I don't have all of the answers. I'm actively trusting Him to provide and to be at work in my life and to bring sustaining grace for what I'm going through. Dependence involves humbly feeling my need and coming in a spirit of prayer, recognizing that God answers prayer and I am a weak and needy person. Dependence means submitting to his good and sovereign plans. So waiting is not just passively being inactive, but rather it's proactively looking to God in faith and trusting him to provide and humbly feeling my need and going to him in prayer, submitting to his good and sovereign plans. And waiting also includes patience. And again, not the kind of patience where I'm just sitting here until this storm passes over. I can't go out and play. No, rather this is the endurance that the Scriptures speak about. This is the perseverance the Scriptures speak about. This is the active participation, the willingness to continue living as a Christ follower even when answers are scarce a spirit of active participation in what God is doing. And so David expresses that, that he will wait with a spirit of dependence and endurance. He will wait on God's good name, which is really just another way of saying on God himself and all that God is and all that that name represents. So even as David is running from a cave to a forest trying to elude King Saul, you have a sense that where for a time it looked like David had come away from really trusting God, seems like he's coming back, remembering how he needs to walk with the Lord, and, and maybe it's beginning to settle into his mind as well that this is not going to be over in a few days. He's going to have to learn how to live in the midst of this ongoing tribulation that's not going away. It's good, it's okay for us to pray for deliverance. But just as much, we need to pray for submission if God says that deliverance is not his best plan. But the context here is significant. David is going to wait on God's name in the presence of your saints. Now, brothers and sisters, this would include the community of worshiping believers but I think likely with an emphasis on the corporate worship of the assembled people of God, like we are doing right now. I mean, where do we regularly praise God's name together and wait on His name and exalt His name in praise and in prayer? Is it not in the presence of His saints in gathered worship? Let's not miss this. God's design is for His people to regularly and physically gather together in the same place and worship together because it's not just about hearing a good message. It's not just about singing some enjoyable songs. It's about what happens when God's people gather together in the midst of their trials and worship together in our praying and in our reading and in our singing and in our preaching and in our ordinances, we proclaim the salvation of the Lord. We proclaim together that God is good. We publicly acknowledge God's specific mercies when we get the opportunity, which is what David is talking about here. Maybe 
It's a specific deliverance that needs to be shared with the saints. And we especially have that opportunity in our small groups and on Sunday for our Sunday, um, Sunday night prayer services. And it's one of the reasons I would encourage you to make a commitment to those activities. They're not just additional things. It's when we gather together and specifically praise the name of the Lord for deliverances and go to Him in prayer for the deliverances that have not yet come. And we share some of those together. Now, obviously, we're not going to share all of them. It wouldn't be always appropriate. But David is saying here, it is appropriate to share specific deliverances, perhaps that the congregation has come together to pray about. Maybe God brought justice to a specific evil. Maybe God answered a sister's prayer for reconciliation or a brother's prayer for healing. And in the midst of God's people, we declare together what God has done for us. And sometimes in our prayer meetings, we have opportunity to be specific. Significant acts of mercy deserve specific and public praise before God's assembled people. You see, those, those public praises illustrate to others the benevolent and merciful character of God, which remind other believers of God's covenant mercies and provide a powerful testimony to unbelievers. When one brother is blessed, we all rejoice. When one sister is weeping, we all weep. Now I have to say that, that some of my views of worship have changed a little bit over the years. When I was younger and the emphasis was on a, a more serious God-centered worship, I used to think I should only think about God and block others out and just come and it's, it's me and it's God. I don't actually think that's biblical, which is why I've changed my thinking on it. Now, I want to have a sense of what my brothers and sisters are going through as we gather in worship. How is God ministering His Word to them as we confess these truths together in song? Who has cause to rejoice this morning? Or who is waiting on God as they go through an intense trial? Again, we're not going to know all of these things, but we should have some sense as we come into worship together of something of what is going on in the lives of our brothers and sisters. And, and when we sing, there ought to be a sense in which we're, we're praying in our hearts for one another and singing to one another and saying, Lord, I know this sister that really needs to grab a hold of this truth today and your promises and your goodness. Lord, minister to her heart as we sing this song together and as we confess the same truths. Lord, minister to her heart. Now, we can only do this if we have some measure of knowledge and relationship with those around us. We're not going to be able to know everything, and some things are not ours to know at all, but what do you know about those worshiping with you? Do you take the opportunity before and after a service to get to know those that are around you in worship? Perhaps in a way that would actually be significant as you worship together. It, with, a, with this kind of a sense, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm as bad as, as anybody when it comes to just, you know, light and fluffy conversation, but we need to have a sense as we talk to one another. You know, we're getting ready to worship our God together, and that trial that you're going through, even if you're not stating it, you know, to me before the service, that's very relevant to what's about to happen. Because the truths we're about to sing, the truths we're about to pray and to read and to preach and to symbolize in the ordinances are exactly what we need in the midst of the storm. So how does your relationship 
with a brother or a sister change the way that we sing to one another? As we draw this to a close, I, I want to share something with you. I don't really like doing this that much because I, I don't want it to become about me. And, and frankly, I get kind of tired about talking about chronic illness, but it's where the Lord has me. And frankly, I feel like some of you might need to hear it. So what, one of the things that I've found, and if you're, if you're visiting today, I've shared with the congregation in the past that I have a, a Lyme disease diagnosis. But one of the things that I've learned over time is that perhaps an even greater problem than Lyme disease is mold illness, and we're still trying to figure that out and work through that. And if there are three overwhelming symptoms that my nurse practitioner tells me are actually uh, very much a part of mold illness and uh, very common, but together they can actually be pretty overwhelming. Uh, and that is a, a debilitating fatigue, brain fog, and depression. Now, I don't know if you even know what brain fog is, and it's kind of hard to describe. One way that I try to describe it is at times it's almost like I feel like I'm watching myself live life instead of actually connected to the situation and to the people. By the way, it's, okay, it's pretty good this morning in case you're wondering. Um, there have been times in the past, the Lord has helped in recent months, it's actually gotten a lot better. There have been times when I stepped up to preach a couple years ago and, and I just felt like I, I was in some sort of a dream and there you all were and I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do but there's like no connection to what's happening. That's the best I can do if you've never experienced it. But you combine um, a serious fatigue, an unrelenting fatigue with brain fog and depression and it can be pretty overwhelming and, and at times debilitating. And I'll tell you how it's, it's impacted personal devotions. First of all, there are times physically when it is really difficult to just process what I'm reading. Like because of the weariness and the brain fog, it's just, you know how you are. I mean, when you're tired, you've seen this happen. You read the same line six times and you still haven't understood it. But that's like all the time sometimes for me where it's just, I'm having a hard time processing what's on the page or what I'm listening to, so I try different things to try to help. So that's part of it. But then for those of you who have had some serious issues with depression, there's a whole other part of this. For instance, feeling condemnation in a passage where there is no condemnation. Feeling the darkness in, in a situation way more than it ought to be felt. Now, if it, um, if it um, shakes you up a little bit that you have a pastor who struggles with depression, I would say that I'm in pretty good company with David and Spurgeon, um, but you can pray for me. I, I'd rather it not be a, a situation, but maybe some of you are dealing with it, and it's uncomfortable, and you're struggling, and maybe you're reticent to talk about it. But I, I just think we need to talk about these things. But let me tell you something that's interesting. Even when there have been times when personal devotions have been a, a real challenge to profit from, you know what has actually oftentimes been amongst the most helpful of things for me? Corporate worship. I don't know entirely why. Some of that might be my personality, my constitution, but... There's something about singing together that gets through my brain and my body into my soul, especially when my brothers and sisters are in the room singing those same truths with me. And I think that there are elements of this that clearly have been designed by God for us to be physically in the same place, worshiping the Lord together. So I want to say, brother or sister, if you are hurting for whatever reason because of the sin and fallenness of this world, don't pull back from the family of God. There are a lot of reasons you're going to be tempted to do that. But don't pull back from the family of God. Get closer. Let some of God's people know what you're going through. And when we come together to worship, let God work in your heart through His people. 
Because there's something about hearing a struggling brother or sister sing those same truths and you know they're fighting for it too. That they're doing what they can to, to exercise their faith. Sometimes we get this very mistaken notion that I'm the only one who's struggling in this context. I'm the only one whose faith is waning. I'm the only one who has doubts about God. So I can't bring any of that up because look at them. Look at all of them worship. You know, sometimes we're worshiping. We're fighting to hold on to God. We're singing that God will hold on to us because we're struggling to hold on to Him. And if you're struggling, don't pull back and hide in the shadows. Talk to your brothers and sisters. And you're going to find a community of strugglers who by God's grace are being enabled to persevere whose faith continues on because of His goodness and the work of the Holy Spirit. But you're not going to find a group of people who have arrived and what are you doing in our presence? No. You can come as a co-struggler and together we'll continue to sing God's truth and sing God's faithfulness to one another in the midst of the storms until by God's grace we all safely arrive to forever be with the Lord. David says, I will praise you forever because you have done it. And in the presence of your saints, I will wait on your name for it is good. And maybe, I'm sure there are some online or with us this morning who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I will just say, after you've heard all that you've heard from this psalm, How could you possibly be content continuing on as one who is fighting against God, one who is still in their sins, one who would relate more to Doeg and to Saul than to David? Remember we said a couple weeks ago that the difference between David and Doeg was not that David never sinned, it's that he confessed his sin and he came back to the loving kindness and the steadfast love of his covenant-keeping God. That's the difference. So you don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to figure all of this stuff out. You need to come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and find freedom from your sin and find hope for the darkness that you might find as a significant part of your life. But it's by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ that you can have that hope and the sense of being a part of his people as together we traverse this earth until he returns or until he takes us home. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't continue on like this alone. You're only headed for judgment and condemnation if you continue on in your sin. But Jesus stands ready to save. There's no reason for you to continue on in your sin this morning. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and come to him in faith. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, minister your word to our hearts. Give us hope where hope had dimmed Give us faith where faith had waned. Bring us back to our standing as sons and daughters of God. Give us hope in the words of David's psalm. And teach us, Lord, to wait on your name in the presence of the saints all of the days on this earth. Lord, be merciful to those who have not believed on Jesus. Show them their sin so that they will run to the Savior. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.